Section 19 of The Mystery of the Ocean Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell. Section 19 An Old Shipwright. In the days of Queen Anne, a shipwright wrote a book upon his art. Of his qualification for such an undertaking, one gets a good idea from what he says in his preface. "'Tis the product of thirty-two years' study and experience, for tis very well known that I have been so long employed in Her Majesty's service and that of her royal predecessors, so that I may say I was in a manner a born seaman, as most of my ancestors were. My grandfather was foreman to the shipwrights in Her Majesty's yard in Deptford thirty years. My uncle, Mr. Bagwell, died master builder of Her Majesty's yard at Portsmouth, my father and several of my relations were master carpenters in the Royal Navy, and I myself have had the honor to act in the quality of master carpenter of three of Her Majesty's ships, and for fifteen years last past have served Her Majesty in the inspection and direction of the work done by part of the shipwrights at Portsmouth. So that posterity should be very well satisfied that when this old Queen Anne man sat down to relate to the public of his day all that he could tell about his particular business, he knew exactly what he was going to write about. It is a book that would have delighted Charles Lamb, had that author had any relish for marine acronisms and the sort of nautical literary flavor that sets one thinking of the smell of a bit of green timber fished up out of a wreck that has been for a century under water. It is full of intoxicated-looking woodcuts, which defy the most painstaking inspection, and the language throughout is amusingly quaint with simplicity of mind and the gravelly aired knowledge, of a most childlike aspect as one might suppose, to us of this scientific generation. The pleasure I found in reading this old book was the sort of pleasure any man proud of our maritime traditions, and a lover of what is early and distant in the sailor's calling, would take in looking over a very old ship. A vessel built, say, in Queen Anne's reign, rigged as craft were then, and manned by seamen capable of telling the visitor the names which ropes and sails and rigging had, in the days when Swift was wrecking Gulliver, and when Dampier was gaining in the South Seas, those wonderful experiences which Defoe was afterwards to profit from in dealing with the surprising adventures of such gentlemen as Colonel Jack and Captain Singleton. There is no ship in this age anywhere to be found that was built and rigged and equipped in the days of Queen Anne. But an old author, after the pattern of the shipwright I am dealing with, talking to one out of a book, comes very near to reconstructing such a craft. And, as a guide, he is bound to be cleverer and livelier than any modern could prove, even if there was a real Queen Anne ship to look at because he not only appears before us habited in the garb of an artisan who worked scores and scores of years ago in Her Majesty's yards, but can show us hands hardened with the tree nails he has driven into many a vanished fabric, and the saws with which he has cut through the grain of many a noble piece of hardy English oak. The history of shipbuilding in this country is the history of England. It was the ringing echo of the shipwright's hammer that gave, as it still gives, to rule Britannia its true melody. But how many of us, I wonder, and looking at a fine modern sailing ship, think of her as the outcome of centuries of slow experimental toil. Meet such a craft on the high seas, under full sail, you realize then the superb taste that has gone to the creation of that fabric, sentient upon the spirit of the deep. You remark square upon square of the canvas rising and dwindling as the white spaces mount, and your heart salutes the gracefulest object in the world. See the jibs, swelling from the jib booms and beautiful curves to the mastheads, the courses, and topsails, and togonsails, rounding like a woman's bosom on either side of the tension of the butt lines, the royals and skysails, shining like stars up in the dark blue air. Note the perfect symmetry of every yard and every space of canvas, the judgment exhibited in every shroud, stay and backstay, the grand dominating pointing of the bowsprit and the jabooms, the molded sides along which the snow-white froth is rushing, then consider the ease with which this large and lovely fabric is rendered obedient, how by the braces the yards may be trimmed till the leaning vessel slides aslant the wind, like a gull in the eye of a gale. We know what painters think of such a picture. We know how the dullest eye will brighten to such a sight. But to appreciate all it means, we must go a long, long way back into times interior to periwigs, when the spirit of adventure was a kind of madness, and when all the mechanical brains of the nation were planning and devising ocean vehicles for the navigation of the unmeasured seas behind whose blue girdle lay the fairy lands of pearl and gold and gems. To encounter a Queen Anne shipwright is like halting in a halfway house. My old author's grandfather, who was foreman to the shipwrights in Her Majesty's yard in Deptford thirty years, would, 
had he been alive when his grandson in his old age was writing his book on shipbuilding, have doubtless wandered about the yards with mouth wide open with wonder at the things he saw, whilst he compared them with the things which he remembered. No doubt he would see plenty to find fault with. One can picture him shaking a withered face over the design of a ship whose length was to be actually three times that of her beam, and he might possibly resent the regular use of the Togonsol as an innovation that would account for many a missing craft. But he could not but be astonished at such ambitious progress as reckoned the construction of a great ship of four hundred tons nothing to excite marvel, and he might find something to respect, perhaps, in the taste that restricted the height of the poop to about twice that of the forecastle. Yet it must be admitted that this old grandfather would not have found that much advance had been made in respect of beauty, symmetry, and convenience during the time that he had flourished. Even his grandson would have had to go on living pretty nearly another century from the date of his book to understand that the British shipwright had been woefully lacking in good taste, not only during his own, but during his grandfather's and great-grandfather's time. Yet let these ancient workmen have due honor. Bit by bit they had progressed, adding here, narrowing there, inventing marine terms, which can perish only with the language, and their claim as the creators of the stateliest sailing ship that at the present day leaves the mercy for the Thames is tenfold larger than can be advanced by the actual builder of the vessel. This is the consideration that makes one read such a book as this, with the same deep interest that one would find in the inspection of a completely rigged ship of that age. It is the stateliness of the full-branched oak that gives the sapling its fascination. In going over a vessel two hundred years old, were such a vessel possible, a man might feel not a little surprised to learn that the names of much of the rigging and spars of the ancient craft were identical with those now in use and applied to the same objects. One never feels so much how old a calling the sailors is, till one turns back to an age in which the mariner's vocation seems little more than an affair of galleases and row barges. In this dim and dusty Queen Anne book on shipbuilding I find hundreds of words which form at this time the seaman's vocabulary. Whenever the spelling differs from ours, the etymology is suggested, as, for example, in the word jib, G-Y-B, for jib, J-I-B, which explains the derivation of the term jibing, G-Y-B-I-N-G, or jibing, J-I-B-I-N-G, as it is sometimes spelt, though it used to be pronounced jibbing. It would be well, perhaps, if old works of this kind were accepted as authoritative in respect to the orthography of sea words. There is no need to write shrouds, S-H-R-O-U-D-S, shrouds, S-H-R-O-W-D-S, but such words as halyards, H-A-L-L-Y-A-R-D-S, lanyards, L-A-N-Y-A-R-D-S, mizzen, M-I-Z-I-N, and the like might not unreasonably have been left as they were written in days when the meaning they had, as apart from the signification they imparted, was fully understood. A full-rigged ship in the time of this author differed but little in essentials and terms from the same fabric of the day. The royal had not then come into use, but I noticed the frequent employment of the term stump top gallant mast which might easily be thought to imply that long topgallant masts were also in existence. They had a mizzen yard, as well as a crossjack yard. This mizzen yard is described as being as long as the foreyard. It was of a latine nature, lying when hoisted, at an angle upon the mizzen mast, and supplying with its after end a gaff for a sail that would with us be termed the spanker. The furniture of the bowsprit was very different from what it now is. Upon this bar was set a spritsail, and a spritsail topsail, and there was also a top or platform for men to stand on. The only kind of jib I find my author to speak of, he calls a flying jib, a sail of good service to draw the ship forward, but very prejudicial to the wear of the ship forward. It is used with a boom or small mast extended at the extreme of the bowsprit. It is not so very many years since that flying jib boom of a ship was a separate spar, distinct from the jib boom, and reaving through irons on it, so that, at all events, it is a Queen Anne fashion that survived certainly down to the year 1860. Their staysails were then as now, excepting that there were no royal staysails. They also had sails called studding sails, made use of at the extremes of the main yard and topsail yards, very beneficial when the ship goes before the wind or quartering, otherwise they are useless. We must have somewhat improved upon this, seeing that, on a bowline, a foretopmast sudden sail can be set and made to do good work. Then again, their lower yards come down on the bulwarks by means of jeers, a custom that lasted long enough to be within the experience of many living seamen. The patent trust dislodged this cumbrous arrangement, though I dare say old mariners would often believe that the safety of their ships depended upon stripping her aloft and getting the lower yards on deck. Saving the names applied to such obsolete arrangements as spritsels, round tops, jack cross trees, and so forth, the present age still preserves most of the shipbuilding and nautical terms in use in the days of this old author, and one reads, not without surprise, in a book printed nearly two centuries ago, 
of jackstaffs, lifts, and backstays, of gammoning, clue garnets, and ratlines, of caps, tops, and dead eyes, and of guest ropes, bowlins, and bolt ropes. Such indeed is marine conservatism in the matter of nomenclature that I believe could any seaman who had sailed with Anson or Carteret, or even with Hawkins or Cavendish, arise from his grave and sign articles for the most eminently modern vessel that now uses the West India docks, he could scarcely receive an order, the language of which, in so far as it referred to ropes and sails and masts, would not be perfectly intelligible to him. Here, for instance, is a sampling of nautical phraseology current when Queen Anne was reigning. Reeves, meaning reef points, are to take up part of the sail as the wind rises, and it becomes dangerous either for the sides of the ship or the mast to carry the topsail a trip, and if it should be lowered without being reefed it will not stand sharp to the wind, but bag and be opposed to the motion of the ship. Again, the lower part of the topsails are spread by the main yards, there being blocks provided for that purpose called topsail sheet blocks, the topsail sheets being reeved there, and brought through another block near the slings of the yard, and so handed down to the decks where they are reeved through night heads, and so hauled home, and belayed about the night heads or topsail bits. All this is quaintly enough expressed, but who would suppose that it was two centuries old? This ancient shipwright devotes a chapter of his work to what he calls hydrostatic problems, or the nature of shipping considered. At this particular period, when sonatorial fulminations against shipowners are resounding throughout the land, and when we are taught to regard overloading as peculiarly the vice of this age, one starts on coming in my dingy, queerly printed volume on such passages as this. Some ships, and from some places, are laden a good deal deeper than they are from others, and indeed many are extravagantly laden, especially colliers. So then, nearly two hundred years ago there were owners, clad in full-bottomed wigs, wearing swords, and wrapping jeweled snuff-boxes in polite coffee-houses, behaving precisely as their posterity are acting, as one should suppose. How was it that no Mr. Plumsoe arose in those days? How was it that there was no president of the Board of Trade to fire round after round at the heads of the ship-owning community? My old shipwright picturesquely explains why. But of such persons that sink their craft by so doing, I cannot perceive who they can disoblige more than themselves, provided they sink in the sea, and do not hinder or embarrass the sailing of other ships, or the uses which may be requisite to the trade of other men. That is to say, founder if you please in sixty fathoms, but don't go and sink in our fairways, or in our harbors and rivers. These overloading people disoblige nobody more than themselves, because the destruction of the vessel was their loss, and not the underwriters. The passage indicates a state of things which most of us are anxious to witness in the present age, yet surely some moral lies in the shipwright's statement that owners overloaded their ships, especially colliers, albeit uninsured. Suppose the loss of a ship is rendered ungainful to the owner. Will that stop extravagant loading? Apparently it had no effect in the days of Queen Anne. There is yet another point which has greatly exercised the minds of this generation which my old shipwright, nearly two hundred years ago, disposed of in the most comfortable manner imaginable, and settled to his own entire satisfaction. I refer to that extremely nauseating subject, tonnage, on which a specially appointed commission sat some time ago, without producing the smallest result. Says my old shipwright, The measure of a ship may be considered three ways. First, what the cavity will hold. Second, what superficial or solid inches are contained in her. Thirdly, what she will bear or carry safely from one port to another, without damnifying the goods so transported. And which of these, he continues, may most properly be taken to adjust the tonnage of a ship, was never yet determined. He decides for the last, and his plan at getting at the tonnage of a ship is this. I fit two parallel epipodon pieces exactly square, which, together, make up the magnitude of the ship under water, from the upper edge of the keel to the deep load-mark line. Those pieces I fit to the greatest lengths and breadths of the ship, that there may be nothing to do but to shave them to the circular figure of the body. Then I weigh them in a pair of very even scales of equal magnitude, exactly minding the quality and quantity of the poise. Then I measure the parallel pipadons, and see what they contain in foot measure, according to the scale I make use of for that purpose. After this, I shape them according to the direct fashion, and similitude of the ship under the deep load-mark line. I then weigh them again by the same weights before mentioned. But there will be no occasion to measure them again, for you may say, as the weight rough is to the measure rough, so is the weight fashioned off to the measure fashioned. Which product I divide by thirty-three, the quantity of feet contained in one ton of water, and it gives me the true and exact tonnage of the ship. He more minutely explains himself by an example. He bids us understand that sixty pounds of water pa are equal to seventy-three pounds troy, and that one foot of water is sixty-two and a half pounds of water pa, and thirty-three feet make a ton. Then, says he, upon weighing the parallel pipodon pieces with shillings and pence, 
I find the upper and lower pieces together rough weigh 54 shillings 4 pence. The area of the length, breadth, and depth of the upper piece is 80,880 feet. The area of the lower piece is 78,125 feet, making a total of 159,005 feet. Upper weight trimmed off or fashioned weighs 24 shillings 9 pence. Lower weight 15 shillings 6 pence. Together 40 shillings 3 pence. Then, if 54 shillings 4 pence gives 159,005 feet, what shall 40 shillings 3 pence give? And it gives 117, 798 feet, which divided by 33 is 3,569 tons, the weight of the ship at her deep load mark. He then proceeds, by means of the same arithmetic, to show the weight of the vessel at her launching. It is possible there may be shipwrights living who can see what this old Queen Anne man means. I confess I don't. But nevertheless, the chat of this ancient artisan, even when I don't quite follow him, the talk of this quaint old chap, who gets at a ship's tonnage by weighing strangely named things with shillings and pence, is extremely amusing and interesting to me, and I never quit his page without the sort of feeling a diver of sensibility may have, who emerges into the sunlight out of the cabin of a craft that went to the bottom when Milton was bewailing Laiatus. To hear what this shipwright has to tell about shipbuilding, rigging, tonnage, and such things, makes one think of him as a marine Rip Van Winkle, who fell asleep when Queen Anne died, and now wakes up gravely to talk about the art of shipbuilding, as though steam were yet two hundred years distance, and the Agincourts and Temeraires were little more than snows and pinks. There is a magic in such a dusty old tome as this, with its woodcuts, uncouth type, and queerly spelt words, which it is quite possible to seek in vain in much of the poetry and the philosophical essays, the sermons and dramas of my old friend's day. For he opens wide a great scene, draws apart the curtains of the past, and forces you to look back and behold with your own eyes the causes of this country's greatness. His drawings are rude, the ships they represent of a bewildering pattern, but the messages they delivered from their coarse and powerful oaken sides ring down in thunder along the centuries to us yet, and we know that the men who manned them did giant's work in making our national flag what it is. End of section 19. Recording by Todd.